Welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Bubba, we are approaching a very, very important election. Uh, our country uh, right now, um, when, when you look to the worldview of the right and the worldview of the left, um, you know, uh, you go back to the Civil War. We had a big dust up then. We didn't. Yeah, uh, yeah, the country yeah. didn't get along of, very, very well there. A lot of separate ideas there. Yeah. So yeah. I don't. I don't want to be overly dramatic. But when you look at political views, uh, ideology and the separation between the two, there there seems to be quite a bit of distance now. And and America's you know in a position to choose the the future of this country. One of those big decisions is going to come in Virginia. Uh, Cameron Hamilton uh, is going to be vying. Uh, for the seventh district, there he's a former Navy SEAL, uh, of course, husband, father. Uh, he's also a father, a follower of Christ, uh, and uh, has also worked uh, as uh, the division director at Homeland Security. Has served our country either uh, in the military or in homeland Homeland Security for over four different presidential administrations, and uh, he has been kind enough to give us his time today. So, Cameron, welcome to Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. And Cameron, we want to thank you right right out of the gate for yeah. your service to the country. You you've done a lot for this country, and we do appreciate it. Well, it was my honor to serve. Uh, as I tell people when they say thank you for your service, I remind them you were worth it. Oh man, that's good. <laughs> so let's start there, okay? And, and we'll get to the uh, you know the state of our government and these elections coming up, and we want to get behind you and. And we certainly want you to win that district uh, for the state for the sake of the country. But but let's go back to you serving uh, as a Navy SEAL. Um, you know, I, I was reading over some of the material, and and one of the things that really jumped out, and I think we as Americans, you know, these administrations they come and they go. Uh, and, but but tell me about your experience. You you had an overlap. You, you were there uh, under uh, George W. Bush. And then it, it transitioned to Obama while you were serving our country, and you made the point that these administrations matter when it comes to our military, and they matter greatly. Uh, talk they about do. that a minute. Tell us from because you can tell us things that most Americans sometimes don't even know the impact of this. That's a really great topic. So I think first and foremost, one thing that you find with a lot of veterans is it's always country first. The country is more important than your own personal ambition or your desire to be comfortable. Uh, we sacrifice a lot of time away from family, away from friends, missing funerals, missing birthdays, missing reunions, you name it. So I was actually overseas in Afghanistan after the inauguration of President Obama. And I got to see a transition of our rules of engagement pretty quickly within the different administrations. Um, George Bush obviously was coming off the end of his term as president in 2008. And then Barack Obama was sworn into president in 2009. And so early on, we noticed that policies were changing in such a way that it was hindering some of the progress we were making in Afghanistan. Whether you were pro or anti-Afghan war, the fact is we were there to do a job and we didn't want to see a bunch of bureaucratic red tape put in our way that puts service members at risk. Right. We noticed very quickly politics was interjecting at a whole new level within our rules of engagement, within our battle strategy, um, to the point where Many question, why are we even here? We're not really trying to claim victory in the key areas that we could. Um, so we saw this. Uh, again, my, my big takeaway point is you have politicians that many times make decisions without really much regard for the consequences it bears on the service members enforcing it. And so uh, that was a unique phenomenon for me. I'd never experienced that before. I was a young man, freshly married. My wife was uh, not yet pregnant, but uh, we well, actually, yeah, that's right, not she was, uh, we just found out after that, that she became pregnant. That's, that's correct. So um, very, very young in marriage, very impressionable, very eager to serve this country. But again, very astonished to see this, this divergence in national policy. We found also as well that the aggressiveness, the, the pace in which we were targeting members of the Al-Qaeda network, as well as holdovers from the old Taliban days and the, the Mujahideen that we actually used to back during the anti-Soviet uh, fighting in Afghanistan that now we're fighting against us that we armed. Um, some of the aggression and the tension and the efforts that we were applying towards winning the war on terror were really being reduced. Um, they were hindering us in quite a, quite a bit of quite a variety of ways that I could go into in more depth. But it was really just astonishing how these military leaders, frankly, were not caring for us. 
Cameron, let, let me ask you this and kind of walk that out a little bit. Uh, president goes in. He's obviously the commander in chief. But a lot of the uh, officers that are executing the war would not change. So how, how does how does such a dramatic approach to your rules of engagement come down? And do they do they go along with that? I mean, obviously, they're they're good soldiers. They're going to follow orders. But it, it seems like that they would be several steps along the way that might push back on that a little bit. There definitely are. I think we, we discount how much the political, um, political appointees play a role in military policy. Um, so with the new administration comes new political appointees at right. various different levels. You have the Secretary of Defense, you have various others all throughout the different agencies, the Secretary of the Navy, Secretary of the Army, you name it. Um, and then it's inculcated much deeper throughout this bureaucratic system that we we have within the military and within many different federal agencies. What we've kind of found is that post uh, Gulf War, there was a growing phenomenon of risk averse commanding officers. Um, General McMaster's was a kind of a unique phenomenon where he was a, a bit different and divergent. You can see obviously with his tank campaigns with going after Saddam in the Gulf War, how he was using aggression, went past the actual lines of, of, of demarcation to, to take the fight to the enemy. That kind of compelling cowboyish style and innovation on the battlefield was really discouraged on a variety of different levels uh, in a way that was astonishing. Um, so, number one, a lot of our officer corps during that time were becoming a bit more risk averse. Um, we saw the expansion of a bureaucratic state, even under the Bush administration, where more focus on evaluations, reports, inspections, mm -hmm. as opposed to actual combat lethality. It was growing. And then under Obama, it just it kicked off like wildfire. So the environment was already starting with this more big government progressive element within the military. And then Obama just, I think, kicked it into overdrive. So many soldiers and sailors, Marines, airmen, you name it, wanted to be good troops. They wanted to listen to the commander in chief. He has the authority to dictate the terms and much of the circumstances surrounding the armed forces. Uh, but again, what we've seen is an expansion of the executive of our government to the point where Congress had very little accountability and oversight of what actions were being engaged in with our military. So as a consequence, many high ranking officers and officials went along with the initiatives and agenda of the new administration in a way that didn't frankly make sense with, uh, with little to no resistance. One thing that's unique about Obama, Obama did not want to hear opposing perspectives. Um, he received them at various times, but it was very clear and very evident for individuals that worked within his administration, you, you needed to toe the line. You needed to give him some of the feedback in areas that he wanted to hear. Um, whereas I give Bush quite a bit of credit and the same thing with 41, his father, uh, they wanted to hear criticism from individuals they didn't necessarily agree with. They wanted to hear the actual on ground perspectives. We found that not to be the case. Um, and ironically, it shouldn't be a surprise that the gentleman that President Biden has appointed to be his Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was one such general mm -hmm. who very much was uh, had a political bent to his feedback and was willing to feed information to the administration so as to make them comfortable uh, and to confirm their already present bias, uh, but that wasn't actually serving the American people well by effectively advocating for military policy that would be impactful. So long story short, I'll be honest, we just lost a lot of our cowboys in the military. We lost some of that, that rigor and resolve in our, our warrior generals. Um, not all. There's some great ones that were still there, but Tommy Franks, many others. But, uh, but that being said, we lost a lot of our warrior generals that we used to have in previous times. So that's why I think the implication of changing our national policy to a new progressive president was so rampant. And it matters uh, because this this kind of uh, leadership uh, was discouraged and became undesirable. So those those That's men right. were removed or removed themselves, right? That's correct. And now we even saw that during the lighter terms of the Obama administration. Whether you like General Flynn or not, the, the man obviously served this country as a patriot. He did make some mistakes as well. There's no denying that. Uh, but nonetheless, people like General Flynn who didn't toe the line or even McChrystal, uh, they were targeted pretty quickly. Um, Cameron, let me ask you this, because we, we all have been told that we learn history so we don't repeat the mistakes of it. And again, I'm not a military college graduate or anything, but didn't we learn in Korea and Vietnam that you could not fight a defensive war, that it just got people killed, 
spent a lot of money and nothing ever changed as opposed to the Gulf War where we went in and we were aggressive and we did away with a country's ability to make war against us. Yeah, I think the Gulf War was actually a very uh, prime example of that limited warfare scope. We, we've set strategic objectives, they were met, and then as soon as they were met, the cessation of conflict was, was paramount. Um, and so with Afghanistan, and especially in Iraq, those terms became much more broad. There wasn't very clear objectives. What does success on the battlefield look like? What is the end state goal and objectives here for this campaign, for the theater? Um, it was more uh, amalgamous, I'll put it that way, to say it politely, which I think created a lot of friction. So yes, I would hope that we would have learned from Korea. Korea was a unique time because, again, we had some of the arrogance and bravado of the U.S. military after World War II. Again, we came into the war later, but we had some compelling victories, and we provided such a substantive influence in that war that it changed the entire dynamic of the power struggles across much of the world. Having said that, after World War II, we downsized significantly. We reduced our lethality and combat readiness, and then the Korean conflict kicked up, the likes of which, frankly, we had many generals and high-ranking officers and admirals who were not prepared. Um, and so that's why we scrambled to recreate programs like the Rangers, the uh, combat divers, the naval combat demolition units, you name it. We, they had to recreate these commando elements because they just disbanded them and, oh, shoot, we're back at war. Yeah. We need to create them again. So a lot of things like that have have come about. So as a result, I'll be very transparent. I think that the big green machine of the military got involved in Afghanistan and Iraq and ignored some of the lessons that we had gained before um, and instead were more focused on how do we expand into a new frontier and actually engage in nation building. Um, that is something that unfortunately we do not have a great track record in. No, we don't. We'll come back. We'll continue our conversation with Cameron Hamilton when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues right after this. This is the Rick and Bubba show. Watch more at blaze tv.com slash Rick and Bubba. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. Our guest is Cameron Hamilton. Uh, he is going to be uh, going for uh, the seventh district in Virginia uh, as a representative to join Congress and try to turn uh, that, uh, that 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 blue dot into a red dot, uh, giving the Republican Party uh, a little more influence uh, in Congress. And uh, we hope uh, that that will take place. We'll talk more about that as we continue. We we were just talking about Cameron's service to our country as a Navy SEAL and seeing the change in administrations and strategy and how that worked. Uh, we'll, we'll finish that and move into the next thing that you did involving uh, national security with, with, with Homeland Security. But it, it, I'm not trying to be provocative, but I want you to tell the truth. It sounds like to me that when we get involved with the politics and all that goes with that concerning the military, unfortunately, it seems like that many times we get – these wonderful human beings killed unnecessarily. Is Am I being provocative? Is that hyperbole or would you agree? No, no, I, it is a provocative statement, but unfortunately it's very true. Um, I would say very much so political influence in a variety of different narratives and a variety of different applications do not reap positive benefits towards service members and the great sacrifice that they're willing to provide for this nation. So I'm a, I've always been a big advocate of ensuring that our military remains apolitical and that it's there to serve, and that we have a, an American people as well as a commanding officer and a commander-in-chief that fully understand the breadth of what our military is engaged in as well as the burden of command. So long story short, you are absolutely spot on. Politics has, has always influenced our military, and it's overwhelmingly an adverse response. It's, I can't think of a, hardly a single in, instance where it was a positive benefit to our armed forces. And we're seeing that now with recruitment numbers, with the focus on social issues rather than actual combat lethality. Our recruitments in the tank, morale in the military is abysmal. And yet we are facing a time where quite possibly we may look at first world nation state conflict again, the likes of which we only saw during, in, during World War II when an industrial nation, as well as its allied partners, sought to conquer most of Europe. Um, we are facing extremely difficult times here where China, Russia, and many other entities have huge amounts of power and are brokering to be different power influencers in different ways. So the interjection of politics into our military now is especially heinous and especially nefarious, in my opinion. 
So not trying to put words in your mouth, you explain it, but you also seem to indicate when you did decide to serve our country with um, being a former division director at Homeland Security, when you went into these government buildings and you dealt with these politicians, um, and I'm paraphrasing and you can clarify, (laughs) you noticed immediately they didn't seem to connect the dots that you disconnected, that the things that they do and the policies they promote, they really weren't connecting the dot that you just uh, disconnected on the adverse results in our military. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, I only, I not only saw that in the military, I also saw it at the State Department. I worked there for five years under a program called yeah. Project Guardian, protecting dignitaries and VIPs overseas, and then also at the same time working at DHS. We saw the political narrative influence so many governmental decisions in an adverse way that was frankly frustrating. And not only that, but apolitical civil servants as well as service members are just trying to do their job. They're trying to work hard. They're trying to get on with their daily life and make sure that they're serving the American people diligently. Um, and so as a, as a result, I remember being in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We had a, an election there. We were there to protect the U.S. ambassador, and it was a peaceful election. They had a peaceful transition of power from one corrupt political leader to another, <laughs> frankly, corrupt political leader. But nonetheless, right. um, it was peaceful. The people in the Congolese there were celebrating it. They were jubilous. We had actual members of our Congress screaming at the U.S. ambassador. I know because I was there protecting him, screaming at him over the notion that we wouldn't levy sanctions against the DRC because the individual we wanted to win um, didn't get elected. The more progressive candidate that was also backed by many other European partners. Um, So they were discussing how to levy sanctions, how to restrict trade and how to impose financial consequences on the DRC and the U.S. ambassador, who ironically was a progressive at the time, it was yelling back at members of Congress saying, what are you doing? Do you want conflict? D- these people are jubilous. They're, they're celebrating this new victory. They're willing to open trade with the U.S. But because it wasn't a progressive enough candidate, you're wanting to levy sanctions, which will have real consequences on the international st- stability of this region, as well as on the daily lives of the Congolese and even, frankly, impact American foreign policy. So no, I think many within our political class have no regard for the consequences of their decisions. Um, And it's frustrating. I wish this was uh, only a a uniparty issue where it affected one party over the other, but I know too well, and I've seen otherwise. We have people even in the Republican, on the conservative element of our politics, on the Republican Party, who have made similar decisions that very much do not understand the ramifications of their choices. Um, So it's exceedingly frustrating, and all we wanted to do was serve our country nobly. Cameron, we, we hear stories, and maybe you can comment on this kind of down the road of what you were talking about. A lot of countries in Africa looking for help uh, mm-hmm. economically, and yep. they would say something to the effect of the U.S. would come in and would try to uh, lecture them on, on, on gay rights and trans rights and all this, and China was offering them power plants and highways. And we wonder why the Chinese have a bigger influence. Is, is that going on to that extent? Um, that's, it's a slight exaggeration, but yes, many of those elements are absolutely present. Um, look, people, you know, Trump is a unique animal. He was one of the first public servants that we saw recently to say, look, everyone just looks to us with their handout. People look to the, America, to the American people as a bunch of suckers. How do they pull a bunch of resources and money out of us? And so we many times would have an ideological bent and strings attached to financial aid. Now, I'm not an isolationist, but I think that we're frankly too aggressive with giving financial aid overseas because I think we we spend money in places that it does not serve the American people and it's not acting as a proper fiduciary of the American taxpayer. Having said that, where there is effort in areas that we can have cooperation, many times we have a very, very progressive ideological bent That knows no administration. The State Department is a highly progressive organization, regardless of whether a Republican or a Democrat is in the White House. And so continually, there is a focus on social issues rather than stability and peace in a region, um, which is a shame because it's a complete distraction from stabilization of international markets, normalization of trade, boostering economies, boostering you know, defense contracting and, and defense relationships so that we can have good partnerships for surveillance or things along those lines. It's not serving the American people. It's not serving stability in the international stage. Um, and so many nations like in the DRC, the Republic of Congo and many others 
are left wanting to turn to people like China or even Russia for that matter, as well as other European Union partners um, because there aren't those strings attached. So I don't blame these nations being pragmatic over where can they get the best aid and resources. Right. They're looking for um, the best deal. <laughs> absolutely. So absolutely. W w with that being said, and this kind of plays into where we're going next with, with your campaign, what do you think the proper position for our country is right now and as far as Ukraine and Russia go? This is a difficult topic. It really is. So many emotions, and I think it's, it's fair to say that there's a lot of different perspectives. I wish it was a simple pro or anti argument. In reality, there, there are so many broad differences along the spectrum of this topic. But what I will say from my position, the Ukrainian people are engaged in a heck of a fight. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The Ukrainian people have also had incredibly corrupt governments <laughs> going back this past sure. several decades. <clears throat> my concern is the amount of money that we are spending overseas with assistance programs we buy these advanced weaponry systems without necessarily inculcating their military complex to train and use them properly to be effective on the battlefield. You can't just equip people with fancy new aircraft without knowing it takes years to master the skills to properly employ it. So this kind of perspective of, well, let's send all this advanced weaponry, advanced equipment without realizing the Ukrainian people are going to need a heck of a lot of time to train on this. Number two, they don't have the proper nation state tactics with regional campaigns to employ them as effectively as a nation like the United States or even other European partners would. Number three, our economy is extremely fragile. We are $200 billion in a budget deficit every single month. That's money we're spending we don't have. Where does it come from? We, we, we pump it out of the U.S. Treasury. We're barely able to make the interest payments on our own national debt. So when I look at this, I think, Russia is not going to steamroll Europe, in my opinion, because Europe has significant trade agreements with Russia, like France and Germany. They buy natural gas. So it's in their best interest to ensure that they keep some kind of a sympathetic relationship. Number two, the European Union spent a lot of money, no doubt. I would like the European Union to step up and provide more aid and support to Ukraine in a way that's tantamount, in a way that makes reasonable defense. And if we see the European Union becoming overwhelmed and unable to provide support to the Ukraine in a way that gives them a lasting impact, then I think it's legitimate for the United States to consider partnering with other nations, other Five Eye countries, about influencing that region much more aggressively. But the reason we have these conflicts, the reason we have international countries or you know external countries that don't have a robust national defense network is because the United States has played that role in creating stability across the world that lends a consequence with you you can't continually put this burden on the american taxpayer we're not producing a net profit gdp in our country to where these military exploits can be immediately paid for because of oil reserves or because of some other domestic product that we have that you can just dump cash on and we have all this surplus of funds that we can just spill over everywhere that's not reality that's not our modern economy now so i think we have to be much more wise and diligent so my position on ukraine Look, I always will advocate for the Ukrainian people, especially when it comes to the tyranny of the Russians. I just don't want to see U.S. military fighting there, and I don't want to see us spending any more money until it actually looks as though Europe is about to be steamrolled. And even still, people need to look back at what happened with World War II. We allowed a regional conflict to undertake itself. And frankly, from my perspective, there's, there's legitimate arguments about whether the United States would have gotten in earlier in World War II to stop the Germans. I get that. I'm just not seeing the same context here. So in my opinion, the Russian military is not battlefield tested. They're not combat ready. They're extremely ineffective and inefficient with their tools. I think that they will conquer much of Ukraine, not all of it, but much of it. Uh, and I think as a consequence, the European Union partners for the Ukraine should be the primary ones to bear the burden of this, not the United States. We'll be back. We'll continue our conversation with Cameron Hamilton when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues right after this. Life insurance, life insurance, life insurance, life insurance. Not a lot of fun to talk about, but if we're going to be responsible to those who are depending on us, it's crucial, but let's be wise about how we do it. Nothing could be simpler uh, than ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. At the end of the day, when we pass, we want to know that our family gets the check that we paid the premiums in order for them to receive. 
And uh, this is term life insurance. It's 100% digital. No doctors, no needles, no paperwork. When you apply for $3 million in coverage or less, you just answer a few questions about your health in an application. Ladder's customers rake them 4.8 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot. They made Forbes' best life insurance list. The policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying claims. They're A and A plus rated by AM Best. And life insurance, trust your friends here, Rick and Bubba, only gets more expensive the older you get. So take action now. Find out if you're instantly approved and get the job done. Go to ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. See if you're instantly approved. That's L A D D E R life.com slash Rick Bubba. Ladderlife.com slash Rick Bubba. We're back on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Cameron Hamilton is our guest. And Cameron, while we're on the topic of the Ukraine, let me let me ask you to be a a predictor here, like you're on game day picking football games. How is this going to play out? Uh, obviously, the Russians thought this was going to be a 30-day war. It hasn't mm-hmm. been. Uh, the Ukrainians have put up an incredible defense. But how is this going to play out long term? Uh, is this going to be a 10-year, 15-year war? Uh, can the Ukraine ever get to the point that Russia goes, ah, right, we quit? Uh, is it going to end up as Russia or part of it? How, how do you see this playing out? So I think Russia is going to come away with this conflict. I don't think it'll last 10 years. I do think that there will be some kind of a, an uneasy peace or armistice eventually in the next year or two, um, likely under a new administration, I think, which will broker it. I think likely Russia will also keep territory of the Ukraine. They've already kept Crimea. I think that they're going to keep several other parts of possibly the Donbass or others. Um, I don't know exactly how much, again, Russia's technology is not quite as sophisticated as we give it credit for, nor are their troops nearly as effective as we sometimes like to assume. So I think they'll keep parts of the Ukraine. I think they'll come to an armistice, a cessation of lethality, and then we'll see brokered deals uh, that are playing out either before the United Nations or before NATO or or the UN in some manner. Um, that's what I predict. I think Russia will also probably come up with some kind of a financial settlement or settlement, in which case uh, you know they'll essentially try to pay off parts of the government of Ukraine to understand that these are now domestic regions, or they'll they'll likely also sponsor local elections, um, which I think will be inherently corrupt but local elections by these different regions, which will vote themselves autonomous from the nation of Ukraine and therefore legally secede to become a part of the Russian Federation. Yeah. Um, I think something of a conglomeration of those will all play out. All right, so let's talk about a new, a new little feature in your life. Cameron Hamilton goes to Congress. Uh, so talk to us uh, about what led you to this decision and how we can help you win this election. And, and can I just put also subtitle the border? Because uh, this is something that Americans seem to care about more than I think the Democrats thought people did. It seems yeah. pretty logical to us that, uh, you know, vetting people coming into your country just makes all the sense in the world. Uh, and you have checked on that and you're saying, hey, those border patrol people, if there is a high stressed, underserved, uh, abandoned uh, group of people, uh, they definitely feel that way right now. So talk to us about why you want to represent Virginia's 7th District. <laughs> well, uh, again, the question is, I live in the Virginia 7th. I live with my family in Orange, Virginia. We Orange, Virginia is the resting place of James Madison. Um, it's about three miles that way from where I'm currently sitting right now. So I have the honor of walking down some of the steps yeah. of Orange that literally the writer of the United States Constitution had the opportunity to walk down. I bet he feels ignored these days, but go ahead. <laughs> well, he might be, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm also related to the grandfather of Alexander Hamilton, which is ironic, but wow. I'm very much a political Madisonian, which I think James <laughs> Madison would get a huge tickle out of. Yes, he um, would. A, a yes, firmer he would. belief in limited government. Yes, he would. But, uh, but that being said, you know, many different times I've experienced an opportunity to serve in a new and compelling way. And I will say that right now we need servant leaders. We need the Gideons to rise up and to really stand for justice and truth and integrity, but to do so with the boldness that the time and the age requires. 
Um, I had enough people asking me. I had people praying over me and my family. I had Nick Freitas, who ran in 2020, asking me to do him the honor of being his representative and many other great and amazing people. So after a while, look, I was a career civil servant. I served in the military for 10 years. I served in the State Department and DHS for another eight years. Um, after a while, you can't look on the sidelines and be an apathetic bystander. When you have enough people with capability and industry and with reason who are asking you to serve in a new way, service is not something that I shy away from. It's, it, it's what raised me as a man. This nation raised me as an officer you know, on behalf of the United States uh, you know, in various different capacities. So my point being, I can't sit on the sidelines and watch the nation that my children are growing up in being squandered and being sent and sold off in bits and pieces. The blessings of principled conservatism and the honor and the integrity of what this nation was founded on, I think is worth defending. So I've chosen to enter the political arena. Why in federal politics and not state and local politics? Well, I've worked in the federal government. I've worked for three different agencies under four different administrations. I know the federal space. I've helped draft appropriation language. I've helped write bills and speak with members of Congress and actually lobby on behalf of different governmental programs and the point being, right now, we are inculcated with a bureaucratic sickness of our government that I know all too well. I've written contracts on behalf of the United States. I've managed resources overseas, evacuated Americans from hostile regions. I know so many different parameters and things that are going on within our government that I believe I have the experience, but not only that, the insight and the intellect with a limited government approach so as to correct the wrongs of what we're seeing now. I'm a constitutional conservative. I believe that many times our legislature has absconded its responsibilities and given more and more power and authority to the executive that is not serving the American people. The executive is abusing it. So we're leaving behind our constitutional rights to fund pet projects and programs, meanwhile spending this nation into oblivion. So as a father, as a husband, as a Christian, and as just a public servant, I can't sit idly by and not do anything. So that's why I've entered the arena of politics um, the Virginia 7th is a district southwest of D.C. It encompasses 10 different counties going from west in Madison and Green all the way to the east in Caroline, King George, up to Stafford and parts of Prince William. Um, amazing history here. Amazing people. Literally the footsteps of many of the founders. So many incredible battles, civil war and revolutionary war fought here. Um, it would be an honor to represent the people of Virginia 7 as a limited government advocate with go. very strong libertarian leanings so that they can live in peace, because that's all I seek. All I want is for the voters of, and the constituents of Virginia 7, as well as all those in the United States, to live in peace, to have prosperity, and to ensure that their government is accountable and works for them. Cameron, you, uh, while you are running for District 7, your seat may play a bigger role mm -hmm. in who's actually in control of Congress. Yeah. The Republicans have a, a razor-thin majority right now. Uh, in our state... We had two incumbent Republicans have to run against each other because of new districts being drawn. So we're going to lose a seat in that. Um, and it may come down to your seat and maybe one others mm -hmm. on who controls Congress. And that means who's in charge of the subcommittees. And it becomes a lot bigger deal at that point. That's the truth. Not only that, but I will say on the Democratic ticket, too, we've got a, someone named uh, Yevgeny Vindman. Um, he's the brother of Alexander Midman, who testified against Trump in his impeachment case with the Ukrainian phone call. So the progressive movement, they're trying to put up a Hollywood celebrity that was a basically a political bureaucrat in the armed forces into this seat. So they're they're investing a lot of time and energy as well. So you're right. This is a critical seat where we need someone with a firm understanding of the law, with a good understanding of what the, the challenges of this day and age face. Um, but who is also willing to stand and expand our majority on principle. The Republican Party, many times, I've, I'm a different kind of Republican. I've been endorsed by Rand Paul, by Thomas Massey, by some amazing patriots, Chairman Mark Green from the Homeland Committee, and many, many, many other incredible patriots all across this country. Uh, because right now, we need fighters in D.C., but we need fighters who have the battle scars to show that they've been fighting all along, which is why when I was at DHS, I helped fight against the oppressive executive branch with instituting their vaccine mandates. I joined a class complaint that ultimately won in the Fifth Circuit Court to declare that the, the unconstitutional vaccine mandates were, in fact, a violation of law. Mm. Um, and we won in the Fifth Circuit Court. So we need public servants who are fighters, 
who are willing to say, no, your rights are not to be infringed on under any circumstances. We don't need just generic, regular, good old people. We need a bunch of cowboys who have served in the armed forces uh, to serve back in D.C. again to restrain an oppressive executive and to restore power back to the people with a limited government approach. And I believe I can be that man. Hey, Amen. All right, we'll come back. We'll finish up with, uh, with Cameron Hamilton. When Rick and Bubba University, the podcast continues right after this. So does everybody remember the big standoff we had with uh, Governor Greg Abbott in Texas and federal agents? Whatever happened? Yeah. What, what happened? Uh, on, on we that? had troops and razor wire right, right, and right. What, what, what went down. So Blaze Originals, uh, they want to answer that question for us. Texas versus the feds. The latest installment, how the elites use border, the border crisis against us. Uh, we'll talk to Cameron about that when we come back a little bit more. But anyway, uh, they sent the Blaze Original team uh, down to get those answers, and they found an alarming way around the Texas National Guard border blockade to show viewers at home what's really going on. It is an alarming picture that they paint about the border. Uh, and, and you may be thinking right now it's bad. Can I warn you, if you haven't seen this yet, the truth may even be worse than you think. Uh, so, uh, 85% of people reaching the border are coming into America. Highest percentage ever. Uh, this is conservative. They're thinking 5.5 million people have illegally crossed into the U S in the last 36 months. By the way, that's an all-time high, and the number's probably larger. If you want to see this, if you're a Blaze TV Plus subscriber, then you already have it. But if you're not, you can be. Uh, go to therealbordercrisis.com, use the code BORDER, and you'll get $30 off your Blaze TV Plus subscription. Then you can enjoy this original series and all the other great Blaze TV programming, including an hour of the Rick and Bubba Show every week as well, and Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Our guest uh, today, and we've had a great conversation, is Cameron Hamilton. So the only thing we haven't hit yet, Cameron, uh, and, and we could talk uh, two hours. Thank you for taking time to be with us. So the border. Uh, it, it just seems we, we don't even – I can't wrap my mind around how anyone doesn't understand that you have to have a secure border, uh, a secure southern border. There's politics going on here. The executive branch is pretending that they couldn't stop it, and it's the Republicans now. It, it, interesting, it, was, it became such a hot topic with voters. Now the Democrats are trying to convince us they're not the ones that keep it open. Uh, first of all, talk about what you've seen at the border and how serious this is. Yeah, so I worked at DHS uh, as the director of emergency medical services, overseeing standards of about 4,000 EMTs scattered throughout the southern border. I will say that uh, everything you see on the news about the border, in reality, it's so much worse. Um, I, wish, I wish there was another way to describe it. I think that's just the, the most evident reality. Having said all that, the, the men and women that work on the southern border are incredible. They're incredibly patriotic. They're also some of the most diverse set of employees you will ever imagine anywhere in the federal space. Um, they're working hard. They have limited to no resources. And the, just the sheer number and volume of migrants that we're seeing is astonishing. Um, and so we have to remind ourselves it took three days. After the administration transitioned in 2021, it literally took three days for us to lose complete and total operational control. And we had seen this for weeks and weeks and weeks leading up to the inauguration. We knew this was going to happen. We saw these camps growing. We had all this intelligence reporting showing that it was going to fall apart. And everyone pretended like it didn't happen. I feel like we're in a perpetual state of the emperor has no clothes. Right. Um, because nobody seems to understand that this was entirely man-made. Um, so what's worse is that our relocation efforts that are engaged in by DHS um, are actually pumping people to the U.S. interior. So when we talk about dealing with the surge, what they really mean is we're sending more personnel down there to just speed up the processing times, which does what to demand. It shows that we can get you through faster. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it increases the incentive to want to come. It's the exact opposite approach. If people knew that you would go to the southern border, you'd sit in these camps for weeks or months on end. Maybe you'd get into the U.S., maybe not. That would create a fairly fair com uh, comparison and deterrent for people to want to come here. I don't want to do that. I don't want to sit in these right. camps forever. And you know, people would, would obviously rather go live somewhere else in peace. But they come here because they know they'll get turned over quickly, and they know that they'll get financial resources too. So, 
Um, look, this is an absolute joke. The president has all the authorities that he needs to secure our southern border. He has a willful malfeasance, which is why I've been a huge supporter. When I started running in this race, I used to work under Mayorkas. I, I called for his either resignation or impeachment, first and foremost. In fact, I'm one of the only candidates running right now across the nation that's been calling very clearly that Mayorka should be impeached. And I'm honored to have Mark Green as a personal friend of mine. Mark led the fight to impeach him. Yeah. Um, and it was a tremendous uh, you know, opportunity that he had to show the American people we plan to hold these bureaucrats accountable. So everything you see in the news about, oh, the Republicans just need to pass this bill. No, they have funding. They have resources. They have the ability to do this. They're just not. So it's willful malfeasance at this point. And Cameron, the, the reason behind it, I mean, is it as sinister as what it looks like it is? We're just trying to bring in Democrat voters that uh, will likely end up voting Democrat and turn Texas purple so that it's at least in play and eventually block Republicans from any kind of national victory. I think that's that's certainly part of it. Um, there are definitely people that have talked about you know the idea that expanding the voting base um, – I don't know how much influence that perspective really has on American policy. What I will say, though, is that the lobbyists that are surrounding this is, this industry are astonishing. Um, I wish it weren't the case, but we have even faith-based institutions like Catholic Charities of America, Lutheran Immigration Relocation Services, and many others that literally are making hundreds of millions of dollars every year through federal grants to relocate migrants to the U.S. interior on behalf of the American people. Um, that creates an incentive and an environment through which you promote illegal immigration because it's your lifeline and it's right. your financial purse strings to have influence. And then we have lobbying groups that know this, that advocate for it, and that continually invest in vying for members of Congress. You, I've heard Democrats who are working in D.C. talk about the implications of an unsecured border and how terrible it is. And that have admitted, well, I can't vote differently than my party says on this issue because I won't win re-elections, I won't get funding, I won't get aid from these lobbying groups. So, um, look, I, one takeaway I want the American people to know is that the reason our border isn't secure is because the crisis sells. The crisis sells absolutely um, on, on many different spectrums. And it's, it's mm. astonishing where you see a catastrophe like the southern border. You have so much money, so much resources, so much fundraising that can be used off of it. And I wish it was just Democrats. But unfortunately, there's many Republicans, too, that have absconded their responsibility here. I give Donald Trump a lot of credit with trying to secure the southern border because I genuinely believe that man was trying, using the resources that he thought were available to him to ensure it was secure. And it was a stark difference what we saw at the end of his administration versus what we saw in the early elements of the Biden administration and even unto now. Well, it seemed that under Trump, the border, because of the way he approached it, seemed more secure. Uh, the wall certainly will help. Uh, uh, that that seemed pretty common sense. And 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 then militarily, which is another area of expertise on your part, it seemed like we were more respected, uh, and uh, and I'm just going to say it, feared uh, around the world. Those two things seem pretty elementary. Um, and it is, what do we need to do, uh, to secure that border? Uh, you, you, let's say you win uh, the seventh district and we're going to pray that you do, and you're in there and you're saying, here's what we need to do. What would you say? So something unique that I would actually want to do is remove some of the authority that DHS has to apply asylum adjudication and strip it through congressional action. The attorney general right now has very broad sweeping authorities under Title VIII and a couple of different sections of the U.S. federal code that are granted to him by, you, by our Congress. Um, I would want to strip those authorities away from the attorney general so that you can't blanket make asylum claims and process and, and actually grant asylum, um, you know, reprieve in, in for entire demographics of people because they're flagrantly violating the law and they're using key loopholes of shall versus may expanding to a base of individuals that are donating to the party and they're using it for political leverage. So I would, that's one of the first things I would do is strip a lot of that authority away from DHS so that an act of Congress would be required to grant asylum claims and asylum ac acceptance. Um, and number two, I actually believe in holding federal agencies accountable. If they fail to uh, uphold their constitutional and legal obligations, and I believe we should be willing to consider, will you get any financial uh, budget for the next fiscal year? Will you actually have an appropriation that passes? Will your agency even be funded at all if you're flagrantly violating the law or if you're not enforcing the law? 
Um, and so these are key issues that I think Congress has unique levers to pull with DHS. You refuse to enforce the southern border. Guess what? We're not sure if you're going to get an FY25 budget or an FY26 budget, because if you flagrantly disrespect the rule of law and the American people, why should we reward you? What, what are we paying for here other than for, for lawbreaking and lawlessness and licentiousness? So those are unique things that I would seek to do to ensure that our border can be secured. Um, I'm even willing to have conversations about expanding funding and expanding programs along the southern border to ensure it is properly secured. But with that comes the obligation and accountability measurement of ensuring that will DHS actually do it or will you just write them a blank check that then they will reallocate for other projects and not actually secure the border. So I think the oversight and accountability measurements that Congress has as it pertains towards executive action is sorely underutilized. Well, that's why I'm a limited government advocate, because I think that's one of the unique areas where the legislature has the authority and the power. Find everything you want to know about Cameron Hamilton by going to CameronHamilton.com. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. And thanks to all of you for being with us on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast.